My name is Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater, and we have hosted the lecture series here at Fairhaven Senior Services since 1983. Each semester we focus on a theme, and this semester we're exploring religion, spirituality, and cultural traditions around the globe. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and I hope you'll join us for the rest of the series. Uh, today's speaker is Amal Ibrahim. She received her PhD in communication from the Department of Communication at Georgia State University in 2005. She is currently an associate professor of communication at UW-Whitewater. Amal previously taught at several universities in the US and the Middle East. Her research and scholarship agenda include areas such as Middle Eastern media, social media, and social change, women's digital activism, and international intercultural communication. Amal authored and co-authored book chapters, journal articles, and numerous conference papers regionally and internationally. Please welcome Amal Ibrahim. Okay. Hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for um, the great opportunity to be with all of you. Um, it's great to see all of you know the crowd here in the room and I'm very excited and I'm very interested uh, about the topic. Uh, let me introduce myself and give you just a little bit background about who I am uh, in addition to what Corey just said. I'm originally from Egypt. Uh, I grew up there from Cairo. Um, I had my bachelor's degree and master's degree from Cairo University. And then I moved to the US uh, for my PhD. Uh, I was in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, the University of Georgia State. Uh, I had my PhD in communication. Then I went back home, I went to Cairo where I worked at Cairo University for a couple of years. Uh, and then we moved uh, to Dubai, another um, nice place in the Middle East where I also uh, spent about three years uh, working uh, as an academic in one of the universities there. And then we came back uh, to Wisconsin where I'm so proud and a place that I really enjoy uh, a lot in our um, university. So uh, as Carrie said, I'm really interested in uh, just giving my background and um, also my study in communication. I'm very interested in uh, Middle Eastern uh, representations in, in the media. And I have lots of interpersonal, of course, stories and experiences myself. So the main focus is Islam. What is Islam? Uh, some misperceptions about the religion uh, but also how Muslims and Islam represented in the media. So uh, one of the nice quotes that um, I really feel it's related to uh, what we're talking about today is uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, saying, men often hate each other because they fear each other. Uh, they fear each other because they don't know each other and they don't know each other because they cannot communicate and they cannot communicate because they, they are separated. Um, and I think lots of the fear, lots of the misunderstanding can be resolved by communication. Um, I am really happy when I was invited, when Curry sent me the email at the end of last spring, when she said uh, the lecture series for uh, this fall were going to be exploring religions, spirituality, cultural traditions around the globe. I was very excited. and. Um, I'm very proud that our university and you as a community choose to have this as the topic and theme because religion is not anymore, I would say, um, the private thing that we used uh, before to think of religion as a very, very private issue. Uh, nowadays, is becoming part in our politics, in our current affairs in, in a way that we cannot deny. So there is a great need for at least being literate about some basics, some, some basic knowledge, like we don't have to um, go very deep, but at least we need to know something uh, about uh, all of these religions and all of these uh, practices. And uh, institutions like Harvard, for example, um, they started uh, just doing a public service by having one of their online classes free for the public about religion literacy. So anyone can just go and, and have all of these nice experiences and knowledge about different religions. So I'm so happy and proud that my university is doing uh, the same. 
So I know that probably you had some speakers and, um, you know, and, and maybe you talked about Islam, but uh, very briefly, um, Islam is a religion that was founded in the seventh century uh, with our prophet, Prophet Muhammad. And it considered one of the three Abrahamic religions, so uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So we, it's, there's lots of, I would say, um, common things and similarities between the three religions more than uh, people mostly talk about. People maybe focus more on differences, but I think uh, there's lots of similarities between the three religions. And um, the meaning itself, the, the, the word Islam as a, a literal meaning of, uh, in Arabic, uh, means submission. And in a religious context, is submission to God's will. So believing that there is God and submission to the God's will. And then the word itself uh, as well contained the meaning of peace. Um, and the official greeting, so if you go to a place and um, uh, similar to hi or hello, uh, it's assalamu alaikum, which is peace be upon you. So it's a very important aspect in the religion, the name and even the main greetings uh, for Muslims. Um, there are estimated uh, statistics say that about 1.6 billion Muslims around the world, it considered the second um, Largest, largest religion after Christianity, about 22% of uh, the world populations are Muslim. And um, Quran is the main text or the holy book that Muslims believe it's, it's the God uh, text. And, um, it's, um, and as I said, the prophet is, they believe that the prophet is Muhammad. Where they are, uh, usually when we think about Muslims, um, we think about the Middle East. We, we, people tend to confuse Arabs and Muslims, which is not true. Not all Arabs are Muslims and not all Muslims are Arab. Arab is ethnicity, culture, right? Uh, Islam is religion that have lots of cultures and ethnicities underneath. So um, majorities of Muslims are in Asia, uh, of course the Middle East, uh, there is also in Africa, Europe, uh, some in North uh, America and Latin America, but the majority in Asia, Middle East, and Africa. So um, one of the facts or basics uh, for Muslims is to believe that there is one God, uh, the God who created the whole universe, uh, the God uh, who is without uh, children, um, without associates, without partner, and um, he is the most merciful, most wise, and most just. And um, one important thing that I always find people don't really understand about uh, Islam is it's part of your faith to believe in previous prophets. So you cannot be a true Muslim without believing in Jesus, without uh, believing in Moses. So it's, it's part of the belief that you have to believe on these uh, previous prophets. Um, there's chapters uh, or surahs in the Quran, um, and one big chapter out of 114 is um, about Mary and the story and Jesus. So there's a lot of information and, and, and a lot of, as I said, it, you have to, uh, for, to be a good Muslim to believe uh, in previous uh, prophets. There are five pillars of Islam. The first one is uh, what we call in Arabic shahada, uh, or just simply uh, believe in it deep inside and say it out loud, out loud that um, there is only one God who created the universe, and you believe that Muhammad is a prophet. Then there are the other uh, four pillars, uh, salah, which is prayers. Uh, and um, we pray five times uh, a day, um, and uh, fasting, which if you are um, familiar with Ramadan, is a month um, that we, um, we fast from sunset to, sun, um, to, to, from sunrise to sunset. And uh, it's uh, a month long. And um, again, if you're able, if you're healthy, because if you're not traveling, uh, there's some condition, like you don't have to do it if you have, of course, um, uh, your reasons. 
We have zakah, which is a charity, and it's, you can think of that as taxes, for example. There is, uh, again, uh, Muslims who have certain incomes and consider um, uh, rich or not poor. Uh, they have to um, give a, a percentage um, from their money to charity or the poor people around in the community. Um, and there is Hajj, which is uh, this holy trip uh, to Mecca uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, again, uh, it's only required if you can. So if people don't have the money, if they don't have the ability health-wise to travel and, and go over that they don't have, but if they, are, uh, if they have the money and if they are able, then um, uh, it's one of the pillar of Islam. So, as you all know, <laughs> there are probably lots of negative um, perceptions um, about Muslims and the religion. And there are lots of reasons um, for that. Um, first of all, I would say lack of knowledge. Um, especially maybe with young people, people who are not reading a lot. If, you, if people don't meet anyone from the religion or from other cultures, then probably we are building all of informations and perceptions about this religion from politics, from media, and in fact, both of them are not as good. <laughs> so there is lack of knowledge, uh, insufficient uh, information that is available uh, in some places. Um, the politi political rhetoric, uh, the long uh, conflicts in the Middle East, um, of course, the tragedy of September 11, uh, the wars on terror, um, election rhetoric, you know, there's lots of use of Muslims and um, in, in lots of these issues. And um, unfortunately, um, in most of these, they use in a negative ways. And uh, of course, uh, the radical terrorism groups that um, use the name of the religion to justify uh, their own propaganda and um, the media followed. Um, but this is not um, a way to, or, or is not fair, I would say, to, um, to take these ideas and generalize it for all Muslims, the 1.6 billion all around the world. And of course, and this is uh, my main interest, the negative, the long history of negative media representation, Western media representations. I'm not talking about the uh, American media, I'm talking about Western media in general. Um, some of the common stereotypes that um, are there for Muslim men and Muslim women, and they are different. For Muslim men, um, studies and research and, 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 and critics, and lots of people say and found that Muslims, and Arab Muslim in particular, Muslim from the Middle East in particular, where I am from, um, are most of the time represented as violent, as um, oil rich, sheikh, um, uh, barbaric, um, they are violent to women, uh, they are terrorists, of course, is maybe the, the, the common one. Muslim women um, have their own negative stereotypes. They are either the exotic, the different, uh, the belly dancer, uh, or they are the same, the all alike, the helpless, the voiceless, the veiled and oppressed. Um, so these are very common stereotypes that most of the media, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, how most of the media represent Muslim um, women and men. This is a word uh, cloud um, um, diagram for the most common words on, in the rhetoric, on the on media text. Um, and the bigger, the biggest the words, the, the more often this, was, this word is used. So terrorist, uh, fundamentalist, extremist, as you can see, are uh, the, the very, very common uh, ways uh, it's used to either describe in a news article or uh, in a talk show or in a, a movie or a TV show. Uh, and then there's also, of course, the backward, the violent, um, the voiceless and helpless and others. So where all of this come from? Um, one uh, intellectual, um, uh, originally from the Middle East, uh, he was an um, Arab American professor uh, who worked in uh, the US. Uh, he introduced uh, the concept of uh, Orientalism 
and we've been using the word since then. It was uh, 1978 when he talked about how the East, and he was not talking mainly about the Middle East, he was talking about the East culture in general, so Asia, North Africa, and the Middle East, how the East were, was portrayed and presented in popular culture. Um, and in arts, like it, it was not talking mainly about the modern time. He was talking about all of these, you know, stories and novels and artwork that came from the West, trying to depict, to depict the other, uh, according to Edward Said. And he he said that most of these representations, um, Muslims and Arabs, were represented as exotic, backward, uncivilized, and most of the time dangerous people. And according to Edward Said, um, and in his book, and he had lots of um, you know, articles and books, and uh, he has been great in creating this discourse, he talked about uh, how this dated maybe to the period of the European uh, colonization. And according to him, the West constructed the East as extremely different and inferior and therefore a need for Western intervention to rescue. So all of these colonization and wars and things like that can be justified, you know. Women are treated blah, 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 bad, or they are barbaric, or they cannot rule themselves and things like that. So he said that this discourse uh, was helping to justify some of the practices. And unfortunately, uh, it's still now, uh, almost you can still apply the Orientalism um, uh, framework of Edward Said to um, uh, the media. So entertainment media, for example, uh, reinforce the same Muslim others. Uh, shows like Homeland or 24 or others, uh, when you find a Muslim character, <laughs> if you find one, uh, it will be there to Again, either the whole theme and plot of the show is about tourists, about you know, uh, you know, all of these violent things included security and, and things like that, um, or the person uh, himself or herself who are gonna be in the show will represent or re reinforce this type of stereotype. Um, there is almost an absence of a normal good Muslim, like you don't see. A typical Muslim, a, a mother, a academic, uh, someone who laughs, someone who, you know, someone, a normal, typical person um, who has different story, disconnected from being Muslim. Muslim and what? You know, there's many other things that we, we never almost see uh, in our representation. Uh, Hollywood had the same thing, uh, even in a movie like Aladdin, uh, which is big hit in Disney, uh, started with uh, the lyrics, uh, oh, I came, I come from a land, from a faraway place where a caravan camel's room, where it's flat and immense and it's heat, it's intense, it's barbaric, but hey, it's home. So this is a message that you're sending, you know, very early to children and, you know, with criticism, this was the lyrics after you know, change after people, you know, start to say, oh, this is too, you know, this is prejudice and bias. And, um, but people who spend uh, their time studying and uh, examining how Hollywood, for example, represented Arab, came up with the same conclusion. Jack Shaheen um, is um, a scholar and uh, the author of a book uh, he called The Real Bad Arabs. And he talked about how um, Arabs and Middle Eastern and Muslim people are um, again and again portrayed just to enforce this um, uh, stereotype. I'm going to play a clip, and we will continue after that. If your shirt isn't tucked into your pants, are your pants tucked into your shirt? When you're getting in some brown booyah base of a country. It was awesome to watch. Muslims are always terrorists. Violent terrorists. Terrorists. Bad people. Shows like 24. <laughs> True lies. The last thing you will see will be your blood spraying across his face. 
you constantly have this reinforcement of a very negative image of Muslims. There was like these cardboard angry stock brown characters <laughs> who used to waste bullets shooting machine guns in the air, which I thought was very inefficient. No son of immigrants would ever be that wasteful. Muslim women are always portrayed as like the oppressed woman, the terrorist, or the hyper patriot. I remember when I was a kid, I would pray that like Bart Simpson became Muslim or I'd pray that Spider-Man became Muslim because we didn't have any role models. If you could create a Muslim protagonist, what would they be like? A black man with an African name who was elected president. Just kidding. <laughs> I would love to see a Muslim character who saves the day. A Muslim woman who's at the forefront fighting the system, fighting oppression. Who's like binge watching television, who like really loves donuts, like who's very bad at bowling. An awkward guy that sweats a lot. And look, he's eating chicken biryani and uh, you know, watching Game of Thrones. Just human beings, you know, someone like me, you know, living from paycheck to paycheck, dating Scarlett Johansson. Who just so happens to be a Muslim. <laughs> and that's really the portrayals that I want to see, like just normal human beings. Uh, but now you have shows like The Night Of, where at least we're getting accused of crimes of passion for once, as opposed to terrorism. So we're slowly moving on up. What we as Muslims have to do is learn to harness the power of pop culture as a means of reframing perceptions towards Muslims. Right now we need those shows where you have Muslims playing good people. We need it. Well, if this was the case with entertainment media, the news media is even worse. Um, the news media, again, uh, I'm not just talking about some uh, generalization here. These are studies, and I just try to be less, you know, in, in research citation just because of the type of the lecture we have. But there's lots of studies and research evidence that prove and say and point to a biased news coverage. Uh, I'm not talking about Muslims in particular. There's lots of, of studies and, and, and concerns about news coverage when it comes to race and religion in general. But of course, Muslim groups is one of these. So um, recent studies showed that when there is any violent act, uh, whether it's uh, domestic, like you know, uh, here in the US or from outside, and there is a Muslim person involved, there is almost three 157% more coverage than if this person is X who belong to other group or other religion. Even you don't see the religion mention if this person is not Muslim. Like uh, we teach our students, I teach uh, news writing and one of, uh, when we talk in, in ethics, uh, we, we say that if race or gender or or age are not important, don't mention them in the story. But you find re religion is the first thing that come even very early um, before there is even um, a confirmation about who did it and, and the background and all of this. Uh, so if you just look, look at, the, so it doesn't matter even right or left, like I have CNN and I have Fox. And you know, the, the, the title here, does Islam promote violence? And is Islam a uh, disruptive uh, for. So uh, even if they say something, just leaving this title for, I don't know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes on the screen, and uh, someone is watching who have never maybe traveled or have any contact with these people, then this is what I'm getting the image and perceptions from. And um, in fact, um, again, study shows that who is described or what action that is described as terrorism. Again, there is lots of debates and conversation right now on when the news media immediately use the word terror attack, um, you know, comparing to mass violence or, um, you know, having this as terror is a way to frame. And when we teach our students, you can frame it this way, take the story to one direction, or you can frame it as, you know, mental issue, or, you know, it's just uh, a lone person who did this without any. So again, how you frame is a very important thing. Um, and 
as I said, just studies is showing that although that you have lots of mass violence, lots of terror attacks coming from different races, but still um, the news media will have huge coverage and totally different coverage, biased coverage when it comes to Muslims. And in fact, one maybe um, um, reason for that is how also the media and of course the, the radical groups use the word holy war or jihad. Um, jihad in language and in religion mean struggling and striving. And most scholars agreed that it means to struggle against yourself to be a better person. So struggle against temptation to sin or to do bad things or steal or, you know, all of these things. So it's mainly this inner struggle um, to be a better person. And even with the minor schoolers who interpreted this as um, armed struggle is, is making a very uh, clear justification that is you're either defending yourself, you are not using force or violent acts to harm others. However, uh, the word was again misused um, in movies and news media to promote the idea that it is acceptable and it's even encouraged in this religion to use violence to uh, attack others. And um, as I said, the radical groups um, have successfully um, used the word Islam to attach to the propaganda. There, there, there very good research literature, uh, current one, about how ISIS, for example, are very clever when it comes to propaganda, to frame their message, to use videos, pictures. They, they are they are creating a, a, a very good propaganda techniques. And one of them is the labels. And we, and I, when I say we, I'm not just blaming the Western media, even, even Muslim medias are repeating the label that they choose for themselves. So what happens is you are associating these ideas with a religion and you are affecting uh, all of these people who belong to this religion. So, um, and, and, and again, based on results, most victims of these groups are Muslims. Like if you look at the statistics, where the attacks happen, and who are the victims for these groups, you will find that most of them are in Muslim uh, countries, in Pakistan, in Egypt, in uh, Iraq, in Syria, and most of the victims are Muslims. And in fact, Muslims have a great fear of these groups, maybe more than um, the West, uh, because it's, it's, it, they are using the name, as I said, and using uh, the whole religion to justify. So this clear uh, bias uh, or sometimes um, misuse or um, um, of labels just created this us and them uh, type of thing. And um, it's very good uh, reason to maybe understand and justify way, why there are lots of fear, um, uh, lots of concerns when it comes to Muslims and Islam. Um, Islamophobia is, of course, one of the things and one of the concepts that we've been talking about in the last uh, few years, uh, the fear of anything that has to do with Muslims. And um, the result is lots of hate crime, uh, the result of lots of biases that uh, again, apply to uh, people from the religion just because of the label, or because they have maybe a clear visual identity of being Muslim. Um, the statistics from 2015 and 2017 say that the, 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 it, it has the highest uh, hate crime against Muslims. However, the good news is the recent report saying that there is a decline on this, uh, so I'm hoping that this will stay as a trend. But from 2015 to 2017, uh, the statistics and number of hate crime um, against Muslims were even more than immediately after September 11. Um, so things like that, um, uh, attack on Milwaukee Muslim women uh, was a hate crime. Again, one Muslim was uh, a veil or something and someone attacked just because of the visual identity. Uh, there's lots of stories like this, which is not, um, you know, in different places. I should this just because even in Wisconsin, our, you know, I, 
you know, our beloved state, the quiet, the friendly. I, I, I personally have, you know, never had any issues uh, in Wisconsin. But again, it could happen anywhere. Chapel Hill shooting, it, it was a, a big um, a hate crime in 2015. Three students um, who are uh, young students um, uh, in university, uh, they got shot from their neighbor and the whole issue framed as uh, a parking dispute. Uh, although the person goes and shoots the three of them. Um, so things like that, or a flight attendant who refused to give a passenger um, a can of Coke because uh, there's fear that this can of Coke could be used as a weapon. We read all of this, um, and even sometimes just the look. You know, people look, and again, I totally understand. I, I can understand if this is the rhetoric, and if you don't have any other sources to get you information, um, then I can understand. So again, lots of these instances, these are just an example. I'd like to talk in, in the last part uh, more about Muslim women. Uh, Muslim women in particular, as I said, have a different story. So it's not the um, violence, not the terrorists, but they also have their share of negative stereotype. Um, so when I ask uh, even my students uh, in you know, some classes, what is the first thing that comes to mind when someone say Muslim women? What are the energy? If you close your you know, I for a second, and just what would be the first thing that primed and come to the mind? The result, um, most of the time, is exactly if you type in Google, Muslim women. And this is a real experience. When I type Muslim women, this is what comes to Google. And I was, I'm sad, you know, seeing all of this. These are not Muslim women. These are not me, not my sister, not my friend, not my neighbor, not my mother, not, not anyone I know. Yeah, there are some, but these are not Muslim women. But this is what are there about Muslim women. You never see um, an artist. You don't see a scientist. You don't see an academic. You don't see an athletic. You don't see a mom. You don't see any of these Typical Muslim women, normal women, women who has a life, who has families, who has a career, who has hobbies, who have, who have lots of things. Um, so we don't see these. You don't see activists like women, Muslim women and Arab women, for example. Um, a great part in my research, I'm, I'm very interested in how um, women, especially in the Middle East, are using social media to demand some change and reforms. Women are very active. They are they are leading, um, you know, lots of activism to demand lots of reforms, whether political, social, and you know, many things. So we don't see that, and um, this is this are not there. So most of the time, perceptions of Muslim women is the oppressed is. Um, um, probably, like, uh, personally, I have someone asked me uh, before, and it was a very innocent um, question, like, did your husband ask you to cover? Like, it's always, you know, this thinking that someone asks you, and probably it's a male figure, like your father, your husband. I will share my experience. Like, in fact, in my case, neither my father nor my husband wants me to have anything, or both of them. It was my, my decision. But I don't think lots of people will understand that. So let me show you this clip again very quickly, and then uh, we'll continue. Recognize the other day, someone called me a terrorist while I was walking ground in the Arts District in downtown LA. That doesn't phase me anymore. Hijabi, to me, is someone who wears a hijab, um, which is the headscarf. I think that the point of wearing hijab is to be modest. I see the hijab as a code of conduct. I don't wear it just as a piece of cloth. I wear it as a maintenance of my principles as a Muslim woman. My scarf is God's umbrella on me. You might get up and do your hair or your makeup. I get up and do my hijab. Sometimes makeup, maybe not. <laughs> but you know, it's 
It's a part of me. It feels natural. It's like my glasses, just part of my identity. It's um, something I've just been used to doing for so long. I shop at Forever 21 and like H&M and I mean this scarf, it's from Charlotte Russe. I didn't buy it from like Saudi Arabia. People always associating me as hijabi being foreign um, and I would say, oh, I was born in Long Beach, um, raised in Orange County. I'm from here. It's super annoying. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not going to lie um, to feel like, you know, that I have to dissociate a lot of things in order for people to s associate me with other things. The number one question I get is, you know, do you feel like you're oppressed and I'm really tired of that question. To be honest, I there have been plenty of times where I have thought to myself, I don't want to wear it anymore. I just want to blend in. Once I wore it, it's all of a sudden it was like I put a target on my forehead that says, you're Muslim and possibly extreme. When, for example, like the San Bernardino shootings happened, um, there's a lot of concerned um, aunties or like uncles who'd come up to me and, and they'd be like, are you sure you still want to wear it? Are, you know, like, I don't go out at night and, you know, uh, you know, you should just wear a beanie instead. I almost feel that if I do take it off, I'm conforming into um, sort of mainstream society, trying to make me feel less, um, less than them or less than just you know, an American in general. I choose to carry on with it for reasons, I actually, I don't know. I just, I want to prove to myself that I am as strong as I think I am. I really feel like Muslim women who wear hijab in this country are a symbol of strength. Um, and I wanna be a part of that. The best example of a woman that wears the hijab is the Virgin Mary. She is considered a pillar of strength and wisdom and patience in our faith. The whole purpose of it is that your beauty, you don't want people to focus on your looks. You want people to focus on what you have to offer. I used to get hit on all the time, all the time. I put this on, the hijab on, it's like literally people stop looking at me. I realize that it's really about women's rights and the right to choose, the right to express yourself, the right to be heard. This is my voice. My hijab is my voice. I feel like that is America, being able to be yourself. You have rights. The whole point is don't put us in a box. We don't belong in a box. We are the most diverse religion out there, people. We come with every color, shape and size, language. So whether I'm wearing this scarf or not, um, as an individual, I have a love of art and creativity. I'll just stop here, just to uh, see we stay in time. So, so yes, um, I, I cannot also be, um, I, I cannot just ignore that there are some uh, things that are happening in some countries where there is uh, lots of violations for, for women's rights. Um, again, um, uh, Iran, for example, has issues. Saudi Arabia has issues. Of course, uh, uh, Taliban in Afghanistan have issues with women. Uh, but again, we need to understand the context. And I picked only um, uh, Iran as, as example and how even Muslim women were used to either support or to, to, to send the face of certain political ideology based on who is in the government. So for example, Iran in, in, in the early 1920s, there was a rule when there was um, more political orientation toward the West, there was a rule banning Muslim women from wearing um, a scarf. Um, and there was resistance because some women want to have this as their own choice. And in the 70s, after the Islamic resolution, revolutions, it was totally the opposite. There was a required dress code for Muslim women. Again, there's lots of, re lots of resistance because the whole idea is they should have their own right to say, I'm gonna do it or not. Uh, but again, we need to understand that this is not the case for all Muslim. I, I, as I said, I came, I'm from Egypt. You will see every type of women dress uh, in the country, Lebanon, Jordan, um, uh, Dubai, uh, Pakistan, India. So, uh, but yes, it was used. 
Um, and um, just also to make sure that we understand there is no word in Quran, uh, the text, that describe or order women to cover their, their, their hair. There is no such text. All the, the two verses, the only two verses in the whole book that talks about appearance for women was talking about modesty, modesty and covered the, the apparent beauty. So, and, and, and there's lots of interpretation. And in fact, among women themselves, among Muslim women themselves, there is a lot of women who argue that this is not required. Uh, all what I am required to do is maybe to be modest and don't show and reveal a lot. That's it. So even among Muslims themselves, there are lots of, of debates. And as I said, most of them, and like other previous religions, uh, for them, the dress code for Muslim women is um, voluntary choice. And for them, it's kind of identity representation. Again, there is lots of uh, confusion and misuse of niqab and burqa. And, and you usually see any, for example, story about Again, Middle East, you'll find someone who is covered. And again, these are has nothing to do with religion. It's even forbidden. Like if you're going to Hajj and you are one of these women who are wearing, um, you know, covering the face, they have to reveal the face when you are when you are there. It's not required at all. And so again, one of the the misperceptions and one of the uh, things. Again, Muslim women was used uh, in a context of uh, the helpless, the, they need um, you know, saving. And uh, I have I picked some examples from cartoons um, that, again, enforcing uh, the same stereotype. Again, the veil uh, or the head cover was help and prison, you know, come and help us. Uh, or they are all the same, they are unattractive, and here, that's me, there. All of them are the same, they're the same. Uh, or you must forgive, uh, forgive me, I have a terrible memory of faces. Again, how can you remember? They are, you know, there's no identity, there is no differences. Um, uh, or this one, uh, I am Hakim, and under all this bedding is my wife. I haven't named her yet, as if she's a pet. Or again, no personality. They are helpless, they are uh, oppressed. Or even when she's very happy, even if there is a you know, person with a gun and uh, she's still happy because at least once in her life she can be in the front, not in the back. So again, all of these reinforcements of the oppressed always behind the man. So again, if we try to put a visual representation of some of the words uh, that mainly describe um, Muslim women to be the veiled, the enslaved, the weak, the shapeless, the ugly, the ghostly, the oppressed, Burqa and all of these dresses that has nothing to do with religion. So uh, what can be done? Um, can we make anything to hopefully improve these perceptions? Yes, I think if we have more conversation, things like what we are doing right now, you know, getting together, people talk, people ask, and have conversation, open conversation, back to the first quote, communicate. Uh, so have conversation like this uh, with every part in our communities and societies. Um, media should also have Muslim voices uh, included in different stories, not just the national security stories and terror attack stories, just in different contexts. You know, why not? If you're talking about fashion, include a Muslim woman talk about fashion. If you're talking about new way to raise your kids, a Muslim mom, just to, to have what we call in, in media research, normalization and making things normal. And um, again, reporters and journalists, and we try hard, um, as I said in my classes, for example, uh, we need to have this type of media uh, religious literacy, just the basic, they don't have to dig deep. But I think most reporters and people you know, working on the media need to have um, competencies when it comes to religions uh, literacy. And again, using these labels, as I said, that use the religion and confirming all of these propaganda for radical groups like Islamic terrorism, Islamic radicals, Islamic state, remove the name, remove the name of religion from all of these labels because you're making things worse. And again, one important thing that we all need to understand is 
these groups are, as I said, they are not the same. They are different cultures, histories, civilizations, political systems. Um, there's lots of things going on on these cultures, and it's very unfair and very, very um, um, just simple thing to just say Muslim women or Arab women, or it's just not fair. Talk about Egyptian women, talk about, and even this is not the same, but at least, you know, you're referring to certain maybe country or culture, uh, Indian women, different than Egyptian women, than Lebanon women. And um, Muslims as well have responsibilities. It's, it's their role to talk about their religion, to represent. As I said, I teach in the university, and sometimes I have nothing to do with religion. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching video production courses, communication courses. But I always have in my mind that I might be the only person from the Middle East, Muslim, Egyptian, that my students can have contact with. And I feel that I have a big responsibility to represent or show who I am from a good way or to be a good representation, even if this is hard sometimes, but you, you try. Because again, people from this group have this responsibility to talk about themselves and to be part of the dialogue and of the conversation. So final words, I, uh, again, I'm so happy that we have this lecture series this, this fall, and uh, I think we need all of these different groups, diverse groups, uh, whether in religion and culture and in, in, in different things, uh, to come together. We need to, all of us, to contribute to a peaceful, more tolerant, kind, inclusive, secure world. This is all what we need for our kids and for ourselves. No one wanna be in a place and feel that they are threatened or... So all of us as humans, and I think uh, with communication as with lots of hopefully uh, more uh, like this, we can uh, achieve that. So thank you so much and any questions? Oh, lots of, <laughs> we'd have lots of questions. I'm gonna, come, I'm gonna come to the front and work my way back here. Okay, let's start here. I have one question. Um, okay. Uh, I can really see by this that the media report the infrequent violent things. But I have a question about um, is there a real threat? And I'm talking about the terrorists who seem driven to destroy, not just defend. Are, they say they want to take over the world for whatever reason. Are, do you think there is a threat uh, from these people? Now, by these people, I mean, I mean the militant ones. Yeah, of course. Um, again, for the whole world, I would say. And as I said, most of the victims, you know, the, the victims are everywhere. But as I said, it's not just the West versus the East, or a, as you know, like the the class of civilization framework that used to be promoted to us. It's a threat for it's it's a radical groups, it's a terrorist groups, and and that's why I'm insisting that we need to label them as they are. And what I'm telling you that Muslim people, typical people, 1.6 billion you know, cannot be grouped in, I don't know, group of people, you can count them um, if, if, if you want, uh, that have also lots of politic reasons, political reasons, ideology, and, and, and many things that lead to what they are doing. What can be done then against these people to also be respond to people who really are vulnerable? Yeah, I think the whole, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's not me, you know, but I, for sure there are you know, governments, people, uh, everyone need to come together in an effort to fight ideas first. I would say ideas are more important uh, because unfortunately also with the new media, social media, the brainwash for people and recruiting is becoming way easier. So we need to fight ideas, we need to be active and everything else in government and you know other bigger and higher levels. Okay, and then there, here's a question. Thank you. Yes, I have a question. Yes. Why don't we hear more from Islamic leaders in the U.S. when they're talking about denouncing any kind of violence that Muslims perform around the world? Well, 
Is it because of a fear of retaliation or what? Well, I, at least, you know, what I'm following, I, I'll tell you that there is no, maybe one of these attacks. We find, even as a person, I'm not a leader or anything, even as a person, every time th anything happened in the news, I, we, like me, my friends, my community, we become very stressed out hoping that whoever did this will not be a Muslim. Because we feel the pressure, we condemn this, we talk like, for example, I, I use social media a lot, I write, but we also sometimes feel the pressure, like you cannot go out and apologize for things that it's not me and it's not even representing me. And the problem is you are not expecting this from any other group. Like when terror attack happened, you're not expecting um, you know, Christian leaders to come and, and say, we apologize for that because you are not the one who, but with all of this, people, you know, because we understand that is important. We understand that you need to make sure that people understand the difference between these ideas and just normal people. People come and talk and they, they, Again, whether they are covered or not on the mainstream media is something, but at least from a social media and new media, I know people tweet, people you know, post, and, and try their best to say that we are against this, we don't agree with this. Okay. It would be helpful to have the distinguished um, made between Sunni and Shia. These are two um, uh, sec sectors, I would say, um, most of um, the Muslim wars are under Sunni, Egypt, for example, are Sunni. Uh, there are some, differ some differences, mainly in, in practice, so things like, you know, how to put your hand in prayers and, and things like that. Uh, there is long uh, historical um, issues, but um, again, they are, when it comes to basics, when it comes to the five pillars and things like that, they are common. But Shia is um, mainly in Iran, for example. Syria have lots of Shia. Um, Sunni is uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egyptians, um, and, and most of the Middle East are Sunni. Uh, again, there is lots of historical long um, um, differences uh, in, and again, um, this carried on lots of differences in the way they practice and, and the way, but at the end, um, when it comes to the religion itself, it's, it's the, at least the pillars and the, the basics are the same. But again, these differences, so for example, like if you talk about Catholic and Protestant, these differences was used um, heavenly to create lots of issues and conflicts, and again, used in the political rhetoric. Uh, for example, I lived years and years in Egypt where we have, uh, the majority are Sunni and we have Shia. I never even stopped to think with this person is Sunni or Shia. Um, even Muslim and Christian, like we never. They, they became now an issue and they are brought to the surface to create more conflicts, like Syria, for example. The, the whole problem of Syria is coming uh, from that background. So they are used politically, but I would say in terms of religion, um, they should not really be um, that differences between people who practice. Okay. Sure. Okay. I lived in Iran for three years. Yes. And it seemed to me that I observed that the women were quite powerful within the family. Yes. Is that a true? Did I realize that correctly, or am I blowing up the man that's always gone? They are, no, I, I think, uh, I think women uh, in these cultures, in Iran, and, in, and I would say in my culture as well, women are very, very strong. Um, they are uh, powerful, they are, um, they are leading, you know, the, the families for, for a lot of things. It's, it's maybe the opposite idea that was uh, represented as the oppressed. Mainly women would be, you know, the figures responsible for, you know, kids, for the economic, you know, the finance issues, for family, for, for lots of things. So yes, I agree. And Iran in particular, women in Iran, just because of the, the political history they have in the last years, they are very, very powerful. They are, in fact, one of my recent research is about uh, Iranian women using um, lots of activism against the, the required dress code that they have right now. And I was 
amazed by how brave they are, you know, going outside, defying the rules. And, and so, yes, I agree that Iranian women are, are very, very powerful and very, very strong. Yes. So, oh, let, let me get that last question. We have time for just that last question over there. I'll kind of try to race over there. Excuse me. Sorry, a little bit of traffic jam here. Sorry. Okay, here you go. Uh, this is a very short answer, I think. Um, but I've often wondered if Muslim and Islam are synonymous, and it sounded like you use them that way today. M Muslims are the adjective. So Muslim is uh, to describe someone who belongs to this religion. Islam is, uh, is the religion itself. So, so when you describe someone um, that he is from this religion, you say Muslim women or Muslim men. But then Islam, or Islam is the religion itself. When you, um, and, and even when you describe a country or something, some people will use the Islamic word, for example, uh, but it's a Muslim country, like to refer that this Muslim, the majority in this country is Muslim. That was a good question, a good place <laughs> to end it, I think. Yeah. So um, if you do have additional questions, uh, Dr. Ibrahim will be here, and you can ask her. But please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Imal Ibrahim for a great presentation Thank today. You so Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you.